I'm actually about to do this. Hi. The Capri Sun of alcohol. Hello. I turned 21 about 30 seconds ago. Rock on! Yep. Happy birthday. Thank you. Trying to drown out the pain of my birthday being on Valentine's Day. Damn, that sucks. It really I'm sucks. <sighs> I never thought I'd be here. No, I am not in middle school, even though I may look like it. A few weeks back, I went out with my niece, who is a sophomore in high school. And as I was sitting amongst a table of her friends, one of them asked me if I was a freshman in high school. I'm 21 now, beats! Surprise! February 14th, 2021. Valentine's Day. They ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it. Look, I've been looking forward to this day my entire life. I did not anticipate being in the midst of a global pandemic, and I also was not anticipating having no friends or no love life whatsoever. Oh, things couldn't be worse. But that's okay, because you know what I am here to do? Watch the Percy Jackson movies and then make fun of them for you. Besides, there's only one true way to view the Percy Jackson movies, and it's a way which I have never even occupied, and that is intoxicated. Okay. <laughs> I've never done this before. I also have vodka. I don't really know why. I just felt like I would need it. Yo, what are we about to do? Yo, drink this vodka down the hatch. Come on. No, I'm not just here to embarrass myself. When I was in middle school, funnily enough, there were two movies that I always remember watching on those days when the teachers would show movies. It was National Treasure and Night at the Museum because both of them are educational, I think. I'm gonna kidnap him. I'm gonna kidnap the President of the United States. <laughs> That's all we would fucking watch. I have seen those two movies more in a classroom than I ever have in the rest of my life. Anyways, on the rare occasion we would not watch one of those movies, the teacher would put on some kind of book-to-film adaptation, and usually they were very shitty. Hence the Percy Jackson movies. I was not a Percy Jackson fan growing up. In fact, I didn't even read the books till I was an adult, and I found out I was missing out because the only thing I had ever even seen was the first movie, never the second one. <laughs> so I'm just gonna jump right in. Let's watch the Percy Jackson movies. I've read the books. I know how to compare them, I, I think. All right, Um. thank God I have alcohol. So jumping right into Percy Jackson, The Lightning Thief. Right away, the first thing we see are the filmmakers giving the book lovers a big fuck you. Cause Poseidon comes out of the ocean just just in his big god-like form. I guess the mist doesn't exist in this movie universe. For those not familiar, the mist is something that the gods use to transform the human eyesight so that way they don't see all the crazy magical stuff going on around them. They use it all the time. It's implied that it's just kind of there and people don't even realize it. But no, Poseidon just walks out of the ocean and scares this poor dude. <laughs> then he meets Zeus on the top of the Empire State Building and delivers a bunch of exposition. That's going to be a running theme in this review. You. Exposition. Zeus gets angry, blames Poseidon for stealing the lightning bolt, then blames Poseidon's son, who he's apparently never even met. I don't know. They don't really touch on the Poseidon relationship with Sally or Percy in this movie. In the book, it was implied that Poseidon was with Percy for the first six months of his life and everything was great, but that's not happening here, I guess. So Zeus throws a big hissy fit and is like, hey, you better return my lightning bolt or else I'm gonna cast war on everyone. Ah! And then we're finally introduced to our main character. Percy Jackson, played by the one, the only, Logan Lerman. And we also meet our other main character, Grover. Look, I was 10 years old when this movie came out. I don't recall a lot of the buzz whenever it actually did, but I do specifically remember everyone freaking out about the fact that Grover is portrayed by... What's his face? Brandon T. Jackson. 
and Brandon T. Jackson is black, and Grover in the books is not black. Now this is kind of an obvious dumb thing to be angry about in my opinion, because this is an adaptation of film. I get wanting the characters to be accurate, but the person who does the best job at portraying the character should get the role, regardless of race, because that kind of thing isn't in their control. And to Brandon Jackson's credit, he does really, really amazing playing this character. In fact, he was one of the best parts of the movie for me. He's super funny, he always made me laugh. He's just mad because I busted him up with my crutches. Oh, nice. I can't pee with her watching me. He was more entertaining to watch than literally anyone else. But notice how I say the character and not Grover. The character that he's playing in this movie is not Grover. Book Grover and movie Grover are so different, not just in the way they look, that's literally the least of my concerns. In the books, Grover is this really timid, shy, kind of awkward character. But the movie is literally totally opposite. Ooh, the daughters of Aphrodite. Hey, bye bye! Woo! <laughs> Say it is. ladies man. He has tons of charisma. He's easily communicative with people. I don't know why. I mean, if you're gonna be mad about anything they got wrong about the character, be mad about something actually substantial like that. They were in control of how to make the character act. They just chose not to do it. Ugh. I'll get into more gripes with the casting later. I think everyone did the best with what they were given, which wasn't much. Then we get back to the classroom, and Miss Dodds is a substitute teacher in this for some reason. In the book, she was literally his math teacher for the entire time. Was she math teacher? I don't remember. But she was his teacher throughout the entire year, which made it more surprising whenever she ended up turning on him, and it was revealed that she was a monster. And if she's trying to be stealthy, she's doing really bad at it. She says she's a substitute teacher. She's never seen these kids before. Percy Jackson? How would she know his name? You're giving yourself away. Are you that stu- Okay. Hey, Mom. How was school today? The usual. Mm. Oh, Percy being cute with his mom. Look, I obviously love Logan Lerman as an actor, but in this movie, he delivers exposition as if he's always reading off of cue cards. This, uh, dyslexia thing is getting worse. Maybe it's the ADHD. Oh, I thought this school was supposed to make things better. It just feels so wooden and forced. Hey, look, it's Creepy Gabe. It's in the fridge. So what, it's supposed to magically float from the icebox and into my hand? <laughs> Puzzle. <laughs> Everything is about to change, Percy. Everything is about to change. fuck is this, a Blumhouse movie? My favorite part of this scene is how Miss Dodds is just casually staring at Percy the entire time. She looks like she's looking at a sandwich after like a seven day fast. Or like she wants to fuck him. Wait, how- okay wait, <laughs> how old was Logan Lerman when he made this movie? 18. Okay. Still creepy, but legal creepy. I would also like to bring up their age now that I'm thinking about it. In the books, they are 12 years old. 12 years old! Here's my question. Why would you cast people who are literally adults? <laughs> if you're trying to do the same thing Harry Potter did, which I'm assuming they were because Harry Potter was so successful, why would you cast people who are already older than the people in the books who you're trying to replicate? You're making like five of these if things go well. By the time you get to the fifth movie, they're gonna be in their thirties, goddammit! Oh, I have no time to think about that. CGI monster attack. Oh, I should be on medication. You and me both. Look, man, what's going on? Look, don't trust anyone, okay? Don't look at anybody, just keep walking! That's a great idea. Scream about how you need to be stealthy. So they go get Sally, she drives him to Camp Half-Blood, and surprise, the Minotaur appears and takes Percy's mother to the underworld. Percy wakes up in Camp Half-Blood, and he's introduced to the world of the demigods. This is also where we meet our third main character, Annabeth Chase, played by Alexander Daddario. She's a brunette, not like the book. Because hair color isn't interchangeable, unlike race. So blah, 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 they play capture the flag. Percy gets his ass kicked, touches water, and is a god. I will say that the CGI in the movie is impressive for a 95 million budget. 
If only they had thrown in another 20 bucks for a box of fucking blonde hair dye. So they do away with the whole Oracle thing in this movie, which was the being or entity that told Percy the prophecy of going on a quest that would lead him to Hades in the underworld. But they scrap all of that, and instead of the three of them being granted specific access for a quest, which is extremely important at Camp Half-Blood, they, they literally just walk out. Which makes no fucking sense at all! So, who knows how to get to the underworld? Did not think of that one. Didn't think of that one? What was he gonna fucking do? Was he just gonna walk out and be like, okay, if I were in the underworld, where would I be? <laughs> I'm not gonna go through every single scene, but they do include that weird pearl aspect, which again, was not in the book, or at least it was in the book, but in a very different context. Basically, the conceit of the film is they have to go across the country and find these pearls to make it to the underworld. It's really confusing, but they do stop at Medusa's lair, and that is actually a scene that's accurate in the book, but then they go to the Parthenon in Nashville? and then battle a hydra, which never happened. And then they go to the Lotus Casino, which again was in the book, but what kind of dynamic do you have going on here? In the book, they are literally attacked by Furies on a bus, which explodes right after they left camp. They go to Medusa's garden. Percy eats <laughs> himself off the fucking St. Louis Arch. Percy and Annabeth go through a little romantic ride at a water park where they meet Ares, who gives Percy the backpack with the lightning bolt in it. They go to the Lotus Casino, they go to a mattress shop in Los Angeles, then they make it to the underworld. Look, I'm in my third year to a cinema degree with an emphasis in screenwriting. I know they could not include all of these aspects into a film adaptation. I wouldn't expect that, but they added so many useless elements that weren't even consecutive with the book. Why did they add a whole scene of Percy going to the Parthenon? He didn't even battle a Hydra in the book. There is so much world building that they just completely neglected. I haven't even talked about Annabeth as a character in this movie because she isn't one. Her entire job is to just be the token competent female and deliver exposition. Everything that comes out of her mouth is just answering questions about the world that they're in. It's possible. I mean, our parents hate each other. Wait, they do? Mm-hmm. Nice. Gold drachmas. Sick. If you open the eyes, they still work. They both wanted to be patron god of Athens. Right after we were born, Zeus decreed that the gods couldn't have physical contact with their mortal offspring. Yeah, that's your father talking to you. Guys, watch out! The middle one spills fire! Percy, when you cut off one hydra head, two more grow back. The gods are angry. That was the lair of the Lotus Eaters. They've been luring people into their traps since ancient times. We were in there for five days. That's her entire character. Okay, I have to talk about the casino scene. This scene is ingrained into my soul and my brain for eternity. The weird drug state that they go in, the Lady Gaga song, that weird laugh Percy does. <laughs> Can you imagine how much funnier that scene would be if Grover was the really reserved, awkward person that he was in the books? It would be so funny to see a character like that just start breakdancing to Lady Gaga. <laughs> So they finally make it to the underworld, which is in Hollywood. Appropriate. We need to see Hades. The living are not permitted here. Die and come back. This guy is my favorite character. By the way, Persephone was not in the book, but A, we get to see Rosario Dawson, so that's cool. And then she's like really sexually attracted to Grover. Seder. I haven't had a Seder. Which, again, they were supposed to be young in this movie, like 12 years old. This doesn't happen in the book, and technically Grover is like in his 20s because satyrs age differently. But still, it's a really creepy thing to do. <laughs> Good, why don't you have a seat right over there? They get Sally, they realize that they've had the lightning bolt the entire time, they go to return it. 
I just realized I have like not mentioned Luke at all during this review. He's so boring in this movie. But yeah, he is the surprise villain. They have a battle on top of the Empire State Building and there's a couple of cool shots. They make it to Olymp the Olympus, I almost said Atlantis, Olympus. They return the lightning bolt, they go back to camp, blah, 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 sexual tension, the end. That was rough. So the first movie didn't do terribly at the box office. They managed to make their money back, but they did only make 226 million worldwide, which is pretty shit for the budget that they had. And the fact that this was a huge franchise adaptation, I'm honestly really surprised they only made that much, but um, Sea of Monsters was greenlit. So let's talk about that. I'm just gonna get this out of the way right now. The second movie is way more true to the book. It starts with Talia's backstory which we didn't hear at all in the first movie, and I don't know if it was mentioned in the first book. I don't think it was, but it would make more sense to start the first movie with this, or at least mention it at some point, because this backstory is really jarring when you're expecting to just come in from the first movie. any of that because we have a competitive training sequence. Holy shit, it's Clary! Holy shit, it's Dionysus! Two characters that were never seen in the first movie but played a pretty significant role in the first book. <laughs> you know, the Christians have a guy who can do this trick in reverse. Now that's a god. Thank you, Stanley Tucci, for giving me the only intentional laugh throughout this entire movie. Also, it took me 10 minutes of screen time to realize that they recast Chiron. I don't know if that's more my fault or the movie's fault. Oh, I forgot to mention Annabeth is blonde in this movie. Um, kind of, <laughs> kind of blonde. She, she looks brown in some areas. It honestly looks like she sat down to get her hair bleached. And just as the person was beginning to work on her hair, she got a phone call from the producer like, Alex, where are you? We started filming 10 minutes ago. And she had to just dip out in the middle of the treatment. So like, part of her hair is blonde and part isn't. Then we're introduced to Tyson, who is Percy's Cyclops brother because Poseidon is a man whore. And out of all of the characters in either movie, Tyson is the one that they did the most dirty. He has no personality. In the book, he was like this really big, bumbling idiot who was super well-meaning and kind. In here, he literally just exists. Like, that's the only way I can describe his character. He's just there. You should really get him some sprayable mist. Okay, wait. Wait a fucking minute. So the mist is a thing in this universe. You had me fooled. Did the makers of the first movie not own a copy of the books? I am convinced. So the cave gets attacked and they realize that Luke has poisoned Talia's tree, which is responsible for the barrier around Camp Half-Blood that keeps away all danger. And look, the Oracle is actually a thing in this movie too. Every time I see an addition like this that was supposed to be in the first movie but wasn't, it just feels like they're putting a band-aid on a gaping bullet wound. I mean, come on, the mist, the oracle, quests are a thing in this movie, but they even fuck this up because the oracle just spouts out a bunch of random animated exposition. Titans rule to the world, led by Kronos. In the book, the oracle literally gives you a very short, very ambiguous prophecy and the heroes figure it out as they go along the narrative. What is all this exposition that the audience should have already known about? A single choice shall end his days, Olympus to preserve or raise. And that is raise with a Z, as in destroy, I asked. The Oracle doesn't answer questions after the prophecy is already read! <laughs> 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 so Clarice is given the quest to go and find the golden fleece that will save and heal Talia's tree and Percy's crew just decides to sneak off anyway. And then we get the cab scene which was in the book but in a very different context because the second book starts out with Tyson and Percy already knowing each other not knowing that they're related, 
and already having a relationship at the school that Percy was going to. And then Annabeth shows up and then they take the cab to Camp Half-Blood. This scene did make me a little bit happy, but not for the reason that they wanted it to, mainly just because when I saw it, I thought of the book. And then I was happy, because the book is good, and this movie isn't. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. This isn't Olympus, okay? This is the Capitol building. We're, we're in Washington, D.C. Looks like Olympus. Right down to the dudes with power who only care about themselves. <laughs> then Grover is kidnapped, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, because in the book, Grover was literally gone since the very first page. Because in the book, Grover doesn't go on the quest with him at all. He is at the lair of these Cyclops that they're going to steal the Golden Fleece from in the first scene of the book. Because at the end of the first book, Grover went off to go and try to locate Pan, who is his father, kind of. Father of satyrs, kind of. Then they go and talk to Hermes. And look, every scene that was in the book that they translated to this movie is out of order. Percy meets with Hermes in the book before they go on the quest. And he meets Hermes alone. Annabeth and Tyson are not with him. Oh, I love your hair. I wish my hair would do that. Yeah, that'll happen. I really hope that that was an intentional quip about her hair in the first movie. So then they ride a hippocampus out to a yacht. Okay, I understand not having the budget for a cruise ship, but you gotta give me something. <laughs> Luke's plan was so intricate and top secret in the books, but here he's literally just like, yo guys, check this out. Wanna see it? This next scene is a great moment for me to mention just how bad the editing is in this movie. Bad editing is something that's very hard to convey in a video like this, but you just have to trust me, it's bad. It's so jumpy and hard to follow. I literally can't even figure out what's going on half the time, but hey, there are much worse edited films that have won Academy Awards. Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, wow. No! Wow! Oh, no! So they escape and run into Clary's. Some stuff happens. We see a monster for once. You know, the thing that's in the title of the movie. It's a small world after all. It's a small world. I am convinced the writers were just like, oh shit. We're nearly in the third act of the movie, and we haven't included any Percival scenes at all. Let's just throw in this dumb shit so that people are happy. Could you two just shut up? Bill, since those half-bloods you brought, and this stupid fleece is supposed to lure satyrs. Do you see these satyrs around here? Why does this motherfucker remind me of Drago from Outer Training Dragon 2? Why are you wearing a dress? I'm having a really bad day. So they get the fleece, save Grover, Battle Luke, and Luke resurrects Kronos? This was the point I was convinced they knew this franchise was dead. They are throwing all caution into the wind, and it takes Percy five minutes to defeat Kronos in this movie. It took him five books in the original franchise, but hey. So they go back to camp, save the tree, and surprise! Talia's alive! I honestly feel so bad for this actress. She's probably like, oh my god. I got this role in a Percy Jackson movie. I'm such an influential character in the third book. And she's probably waiting by the phone to this day for the third film to be greenlit. Girl. <laughs> and that's it. Those are the Percy Jackson movies. Okay, here's the thing. I get the major vibe that they made the first movie not thinking that there was ever going to be anything else. Like, this is all we're going to get the budget to do. We better throw everything in right now. That's why they didn't do any actual world building in the concept of the whole franchise. And that's why the second movie had to play catch up the entire time. How Percy and Annabeth went from about to fuck at the end of the first movie to not even acting like they're romantically interested in one another in the second, to delivering all the exposition that we're supposed to learn in the first movie? No, that's not how this works. You can't just do that. I'm drunk. <laughs> I get not wanting to put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to a franchise like this because everyone wants to be Harry Potter and no one is going to be Harry Potter ever again. And they were trying to do that, but the thing about the Percy Jackson books is they are so packed full of a bunch of random shit because it's for children. Children have short attention spans. That's why they went to like six different locations in the first book. And obviously they can't do that in a 120 page screenplay. What else were they supposed to do? Why would you make an adaptation of a book when 
you have no material to go off of. I have firsthand experienced the effects of alcohol in front of you guys. I hope you are satisfied. Oh, that's the end of my notes. Okay, shit. I guess I better wrap this up. <laughs> Look, the moral of the story is there's a huge difference between a book and a movie. A book has hundreds of pages to flesh out characters, add extra scenes for effective storytelling. Screenplays can't do that. Every word of a screenplay has to matter. The question we are left with is why do these films exist? I don't know how I ever sat through these films without being drunk. I kind of want to watch them again, to be honest. Yeah, I guess that's all I really have to say. I'm a little embarrassed that I got drunk off of one 16-ounce Mike's Hard, but I've never tasted alcohol before in my life, so cut me some slack. Hopefully we never, ever have to see another Percy Jackson adaptation again, because it is one of the sole franchises that I think works so well as just a book. Oh, wait a fucking minute. There's that Disney Plus thing coming out that's supposed to be another Percy Jackson adaptation. And it's supposed to be more accurate than the films. And it's a series. This should go well.